most of God's graduates know. Amen. In my history books, you'll find that I say churches and schools and nations follow a cycle. Preaching, teaching, culture, apostasy. There's never been any change. Preaching, teaching, culture, apostasy. And all, everything on this earth follows a pattern. We call it a man, a movement, a machine, and a monument. Every church in America and every school in America is either following a man, that's the preaching, uh, what's in a movement, that's the teaching, or it's a machine, that's the culture, or it's a monument, it's dead. Dead. You want to see the monuments go over to Europe, you'll see them all over the continent. We told you about these colored preachers, it's true now, too. You get a real, you get a, you get a real blackbird ready to save and call it preach, he can put it out. Most of them are communists. Most of them are communists. And, uh, healers. But every now and then you get a good one. I've preached with John Wesley Grant before in, in Bible conferences, and that fellow's a character. But he preached on Jonah, and he said, uh, he said, Jonah was on board the ship, and he said, the Lord said, the north wind, what have you blow south? And the south wind, what have you blow north? And he said, east wind, you blow west. And the west wind, when you blow east, I want to have you get together in a cooperating kind of a way. <laughs> and he said, so it began to howl and storm. And he said, preacher, we loves you, but you got to go, man. <laughs> I said, they pick him up and threw him off that boat. He said, but the Lord had a fish there to whom he said, there's a certain ship. What I want to have you swim in the whereabouts thereof. <laughs> I heard him preach on, I heard him preach on Matthew 22 one time, the labor is the vineyard. I've heard it's the thing in my life. He said, I mean, I, like I said, they get thoughts out there. White man, they don't, don't think the same. You think colored people, white people are the same. You don't know how they think. They think different. Uh, he was preaching that thing and he said, he said, some went to work at six in the morning, some went to work at five in the evening. When they come off the job, they would come into the boss, man, he done paid them off all the same way. He said, one cat come up there and said, hey man, how come you pay me off like the rest of these cats? I done work twice as much as they work. And he said, man, he said, I can do what I want to with my own money. He said, you don't agree with me, that's all you get. <laughs> and he said, now the moral of this here parable is this. What the Lord is trying to say here is that uh, it don't make no difference what time you went to work. The question is, is you on the job? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's ask, let's ask some questions. We'll try to do what we can here. Anybody got, got a question? Raise the hand and shoot. Yes, sir. You want to come Yes. Can you uh, explain for us the difference between the spiritual blessings of Abraham and the physical blessings of Abraham in Genesis 12 and Genesis All right. 3? All right, get Genesis 12, one hand. Talking about the two different kinds of blessings given to Abraham, the spiritual and the physical. Well, I get just Genesis 12 in one hand and get Galatians chapter uh, 4 in the other. There are two sets. And one set is for a spiritual seed, one set is for a literal, physical, visible seed. And of course when Paul talks, mainly he's talking about uh, the spiritual. Make it Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and uh, Genesis 12. Galatians 3 and Genesis 12. Now this is very important. Because if you ever get them confounded, ever get them confused, then uh, then you'll make all the physical promise to Abraham apply to the Christian. You get what we call post-millennialism. You get involved in trying to bring in a literal physical kingdom here on earth without Christ, which can't be done. All right, Galatians chapter three, Galatians chapter three, verse eight. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. In thee shall all nations be blessed. See that thing? How many have a cross reference there to Genesis 12, 3? Let me see your hands. That's the wrong cross reference. That's where you get in trouble right there. That isn't a reference to Genesis 12, 3. Look at the wording right there. In these shall all nations be blessed. Now he's talking about spiritual things. Eight, faith. Eight, the gospel. Verse nine, faith. See, spiritual things. Verse 16, not Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not the seed as of many, but as of one. And of thy seed, which is Christ. See, it's a spiritual promise. Uh, to make sure about this, look at verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. 
But it's not the promise in Genesis 12. How do you know? Well, the King James straightens out the original Greek. Galatians 3.8 said nations. Right? Right? Go to Genesis 12. He didn't say nations. Genesis 12.3. Whoever gave the cross reference couldn't read fifth grade English. Genesis 12.3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee, and these shall all what? Families. The fellow couldn't read. Where do you get nations from? Genesis 22. Genesis 22.18. Here's the quotation. Genesis 22.18. Here's the quotation. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. What's the context? Verse 17. The seed. What is the seed? Well, my, my, my. Look at chapter 22. Verse 16. 22.16. So Isaac is a type of Christ. See that thing, 22.16? That's what he's talking about in Galatians. All right, back to Genesis chapter 12. And somebody's got the Bible screwed up. Who? All the fundamentalists <laughs> and all the Schofield board editors and everybody else. Everybody has the time with it. Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country. Literal, physical. From my kindred, literal physical, from my father's house, literal physical, to a land, literal physical. There's nothing spiritual, that thing. There's nothing spiritual in there. I will make of thee a great nation, physical. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That could be either way. But I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee physically, temporally. You can curse a Jew and still be saved. That is a spiritual thing. But you curse a Jew and you're liable to lose your money. <laughs> That's right. That's right. God will bless those nations that take care of that Jew. Now to show you how this thing goes, come to Genesis chapter 13 and look at verse 14. And notice the promise given to Abraham before this time had nothing to do with the spiritual seed. They have to do with a piece of land. Genesis 13, 14, And the Lord said to Abram, or Abram, After Lot was separated from him, Lift up thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Now make thy seed, not as the stars of heaven, as the dust of the earth. Literal, physical, visible seed. Man was made out of the dust of the earth. So the two sets... And the promise of the deal with the physical, literal, earthly, visible piece of land have to do with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the promise that have to do with justification by faith and the promise of spirit by faith, that has to do with Abraham's seed, singular, which is Isaac, a type of Christ, not Jacob. All right, something else. <clears throat> yes, sir. In Psalm 17, verse 15, how is it that David, as an Old Testament saint, can awaken Christ's likeness? 17, what is it? 15. 17, 15. Yes, sir. All right. 17, 15. The question is, how does David in the Old Testament uh, wind up just like Jesus Christ, if that's what we're going to make this uh, say? And seventeen fifteen, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now you can assume in the past it means when I I shall be satisfied when I awake with being like you. Or you can say when I when I awake I'll be satisfied with the likeness of God. Verse thirteen, arise, O Lord. 14, which are men which are thy hand, O Lord. In which case he'd be saying, I'll be satisfied when I awake with seeing God's likeness. And God's likeness would be Jesus Christ. Now if we make this thing like 1 John 3, <clears throat> we should be like him, we should see him as he is. Then we have uh, David uh, conformed to Christ's image like the New Testament saints are in the body of Christ. And that makes it embarrassing dispensationally because that would indicate that uh, Maybe an Old Testament saint at the resurrection would be just like Christ, like a New Testament saint in the body of Christ, which would put him in the body, 
which he's not in the body. An Old Testament saint's not in the body. Matter of fact, a bunch of Old Testament saints uh, came up from the dead in Luke in Matthew chapter 27 before there was any body there. So that won't work. All right, the two answers to this thing. <clears throat> now, the first answer is that David may be an exception. And I'll show you why. Come to uh, Psalm uh, 89, I believe it is. Psalm 89. David has things promised him the rest of them don't have. Psalm 89. <clears throat> we got Psalm 89 in one hand, got Acts 13 in another. David's a real exceptional character. David is a saint in the Old Testament who has a promise of eternal security, which none of the rest of them have. David says, uh, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He knows where he's going for when he dies. The rest of them got the doubts about it. All right, Acts 13. Acts 13. This is Paul preaching. And Paul preaching says in Acts 13, 34, and it's concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. He said in this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Notice that. In plain words, David has mercies promised to him that are not promised to anybody else in that Bible. That's why it's called the sure mercies of David. And those promises are given when David is thinking about building the Lord a temple. About the time he thinks about building the Lord a temple, Nathan uh, comes into him, and Nathan talks to him, and gives him some promises, and says this. He says, When thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the king of his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house, my kingdom, shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. I read that from Second Samuel 7. Now, those are sure mercies, and God said, I'm going to do something for you I didn't do from Saul. You got promise of everlasting mercy and everlasting covenant, and your seed is going to endure forever. All right, Psalm 89, verse, uh, Psalm 89, verse 20. Now, the passage you gave me back in Psalm 17 has this interpretation. And this interpretation is that in the passage we're talking about here, either David is an exception and can be like Christ, or more likely, in Psalm 17, that's Jesus Christ speaking through David. I'll show you why. Psalm 89, 20. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Verse 27. I will make him, David, my firstborn. Was David Christ firstborn? I mean, God's firstborn? Was David God's firstborn? No. I'll make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. Sure mercy of David. My covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed I'll make to endure forever. Who? Solomon? I'll make his seed to endure forever. Zedekiah? And his throne the days of heaven. Why, David lost his throne. Throne went to pieces on Nebuchadnezzar. Who's he talking about in the passage? Talking about Christ. But look at verse 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. See that thing? So many times that Bible, when David is speaking, he's not speaking for himself at all. He's speaking for Jesus Christ. Now, if you doubt that, I'll give you a strong one. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Which David wrote and has nothing to do with David at all. Psalm 22, 1. Psalm 22, 1. Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who is that, David or Christ? Why, it's Christ. Look at verse 17. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Is that David or Christ? It's Christ. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. It's Christ. Look at the heading in Psalm 22. To the chief musician, the Panagelith, Shehar, a psalm of David. 
I'll show you another one, Psalm 91. Psalm 91. So a chance of 10 to 1, the thing in Psalm 17 is not David speaking doctrinally about himself, but the Lord Jesus speaking through him prophetically by the Psalms. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, verse oh, 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Where did you ever read that for? Well, that's the devil quoting Luke 4, Jesus Christ. They shall bear thee up in their hand, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. That's the devil quoting that to Jesus Christ. The devil knows where that verse went. That verse had nothing to do with David. It was the Messiah. Verse 14, because he, Christ, has set his love upon me, God, I will deliver him. I will set Jesus Christ on high, because he hath known my name, God's name. He, Jesus Christ, shall call upon me. I'll answer him. I, God, will be with him in trouble, Jesus Christ. I will deliver Jesus Christ and honor him with long life. I satisfy him, Jesus Christ, and show him my salvation. You can apply that spiritually to a child of God, but doctrinally the reference to Jesus Christ. So the answer to that thing is, David may be an exception because he's already an exception. And secondly, it is probably the Holy Spirit speaking for Christ in the Psalms. All right, something else. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Reverend, in view of Psalm 78, 36 and 7, Psalm 91, 56 and 7, Psalm 91, 63, 7, Jeremiah 48, 20, and 49, 22, do you think God might have wings? God might have what? Does he have wings? Are those things like under his feathers and under his wings, and he bore them with... And then two of them are second coming passages where the Lord... Yeah. Wings and now, all right, uh, come to the book of uh, Job. And uh, the answer to this thing is, uh, I saw that in a track recently somewhere. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, this, this idiot that said he went to heaven and saw more than Paul did, the Jimmy... <laughs> Oh, yeah, that Jimmy Swaggart is, public, is, is uh, asked you to get his stuff. He said when he got up there, he saw God and God had feathers. That's what he said. So that's where this stuff comes from. Uh, I hate to disappoint him, but not only does God doesn't have feathers, the angels don't have feathers. Because <laughs> they haven't got any wings to put the feathers on. <laughs> now, these things are spoken of as wings, but do you ever think about this? Uh, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it stoneth the prophets. How often I would have gathered thee as a mother hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Now those things are what we call figurative expressions. And with those expressions, come to the book of Job, and I'll show you time after time, and especially in the book of Job and the many other places, where God used figures of speech, and the, the figures of speech are not to be meant to be taken literally. Now, I haven't got my own Bible here, and I haven't got these verses marked, so maybe take a little time to find them. But I want a verse in the book of Job uh, talks about people dying, some of them in good condition, some of them in bad condition. And one of them says that one dies with his breast full of milk. Anybody got that thing? Mark, if you got a, if you got a concordance, give me a reference in Job uh, for milk. If you got a concordance, the back of your Bible. I'll be finding some more here. Give me a reference on milk in Job. That sounds like it. Job 10.10. 10. <clears throat> no, that's a different one. Give me another one. 21.24. There it is. All right, 21, look at verse 23. 21.23. 21, 23, one dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moist with marrow. Well, a man doesn't have milk. A woman has the milk. That is not to be meant to be taken literally. That's an expression meaning the fellow's in good condition, he's in good health. But it's not to be meant to be taken literally. And you find places like that. For example, look at chapter 20, verse 11. Chapter 20, verse 11. His bones are full of the sin of his youth. Well, not literally. You could cut the guy's bone open, might find the effects of sin in his bones.
bones, but you wouldn't find the sin as such in his bones. Verse 16, he shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. Well, the guy's not going to take a poison of a snake and reach down and suck the poison out of the guy's mouth. You see, some of the Bible is figurative. Now, we're strong on literal interpretation, and I'm strong on literal interpretation. I'm strong on it. But when Job says he's compassed about me with his armies and his archers have poured my gall on the ground, there are no armies there, there are no archers there, and nothing has been poured in the ground. He's still got his gall in him. So here's the rule in these things. When it speaks about God carrying him like an eagle, that thing there is plainly figurative. You say, well, Ruckman, how can I tell when a thing is figurative when it's not figurative? Well, here's the rule. If it is possible to take it literal, always take it literal. Amen. The literal always comes first. Never take it figurative unless it's impossible to take it literal. If it is impossible to take it literal, then it is figurative. In the case of God having wings, man is made in the image of God. Where are your wings? Amen. If man was made in the image of God and God had wings, you'd have wings. Amen. You haven't got them. So obvious thing is talking about a mother hen's care for chickens and an eagle's care for its brood. And if you want an exact application, there were given to Israel two great wings. She might flee to the wilderness, Revelation chapter 12, uh, Matthew 24, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. So when God had those Jews come out of the land of Egypt, he said, I bore you as an eagle's wings. Of course he didn't. They were on the ground. So it was a figure, figure. But that figure was talking about a future time in the tribulation, the tribulation around the Antichrist, they're getting airplanes. Yeah. And they'll go on wings. Yeah. So you see, there's an application, but it's figurative. Now, when I say figurative, you understand what I'm saying? She cast her eyes on him. <laughs> see? <laughs> see what I mean? Would you serve me a cup of coffee? <laughs> you know. See? See? I mean, you use that stuff all the time, you know. You say, you know, he rolled his eyes at her, you know. <laughs> it's a common thing. You'll find the Bible is filled with those things. They're not to be meant to be taken really. Somebody says, hit the sack. Well, now, you know what they mean. They don't take a broom and go in the back room, take a potato sack and beat the thing, you know. How about this one here, step on the gas? Why, well, there's no gas on the car unless you've got fumes or gasoline. But there's no gas, like butane gas, step on the gas. How'd you step on gas? Your foot would go right through it. Here's a good one. Turn on the lights. Do you think about those crazy expressions? Turn on the lights. How do you turn on the light? You flip a switch. You don't turn it on. Turn on the light. Here's a good one. Here's a real good one. Light the fire. <laughs> Why, if it's a fire, it's burning already, man. You can't light it. <laughs> you see, people that use all the expression, they don't think what they're saying. Here's another good one. It's raining. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's raining what? Well, you just say, well, it's rain. No, you know. No, rain, rain is a verb. It isn't a noun. It can rain, it can rain fire, it does in the Bible. It can rain uh, water, it does in the Bible. It can rain all kinds of things. But folks say, it's raining. <laughs> well, it's raining what? <laughs> so those things are figurative, see? And when the Bible speaks about God having wings, it's a figurative expression. It's not to be meant to be taken literally. All right, something else. Yes, sir. Dr. Ruckman, can you, can you explain the uh, significance of uh, at the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, where it talks about the last trump? Does that indicate that there's trumpets that precede the last trump? All right. Get 1 Corinthians 15, one hand. Get Numbers chapter uh, 10, the other. Numbers chapter 10. Now, to get this thing right, to get it really right, and, uh, yeah, Numbers 10, to get it really right, you really need an Orthodox Jew. And if you have an Orthodox Jew who could tell you something about the Feast of Trumpets, then we get some light on this thing we don't have. But in the Feast of Trumpets, which lasts seven days, the trumpets blow all seven days. 
And as a last trump on one of those days, all right, 1 Corinthians 15 and Numbers 10. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now watch it carefully. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now that's a verb. It's not a verb. It's maybe not a verb. It's a noun. But it's not the name of, a, of an instrument. It's the name of a sound. You make a trump with a trumpet. That is, that thing didn't say, like these fellows read, it didn't say at the last trumpet. It said the last trump. That's a noise the trumpet makes. So that thing right there in 1552, the first thing you want to get is that is not the last trumpet in the tribulation. The last trumpet in the tribulation of the seventh angel of the seventh trumpet over there in Revelation 16. And that's not this one, not Revelation 16, Revelation 11. And that's not the seventh trumpet here. That's a trump. That's a noise. Now he says, for the trumpet shall sound. It's one, not one of the seven. The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now that trump, before we go to Numbers, come to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4. And 1 Thessalonians 4, notice that trump is not the trumpet of an angel at all. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. That trump has nothing to do with the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, one, the voice of the archangel, two, and with the trump of God. That's the sound the Lord's going to make. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which shall alive remain. All right, in 16, notice two classes. The dead in Christ come up first, 17, then the ones that are alive, they come up later. Now, you're not told the interval. But it says that dead in Christ shall rise first, we each alive remain, caught up later. You find the same thing in 1 Corinthians. Now the question is, is an interval here. Is there more than one sound of one trumpet before this thing is complete? All right, Numbers chapter 10, verse 2. Numbers chapter 10, verse 2. Numbers chapter 10, verse 2, make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly. Getting that by together. One, and for the journey of the camps, two. And when they shall blow with them, all the assemblies shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. A beautiful picture of the rapture. There's a beautiful picture. And if they blow with but one trumpet, then the prince which are heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves to thee. When you blow an alarm, Advent, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall make their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound an alarm. Then there are different bugle calls, different trumpet calls. Now we have some. Paul says, if the trumpet make an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? You fellows have been in the army, you understand that? Suppose uh, you went to bed at night, about 10 o'clock, you heard the guy play, you wonder what in the world is going on. Get in the morning at 6 o'clock, the guy's playing, about noon meal. And then 10 o'clock, you go to bed at night. You wonder what the world is going on, man. You get all messed up. And so if the trumpet sound on a certain sound, who should prepare himself to battle? Now here are calls, these bugles. And here goes one. Here come the heads. Here goes two. Here come the assembly. And then a third one. Here comes an attack coming down. And the question is about, well, ten. And the day of your gladness and your solemn days and the beginning of your month, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifice of your peace offerings. They may be to you for memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. Now there's something about those trumpets, and if you get an Orthodox Jew, you'll have that thing all laid out. And in regards to your question, I'm just guessing now from what I've got here. I'm just guessing. And if I were guessing, I would guess that there's going to be a sound... For the dead in Christ arise. It'll probably be. 
It means I can't get them up, I can't get them up, I can't get them up. <laughs> and, and they get up. And then sometime after that, you say, how long after? I don't know. An hour, two hours, 24 hours, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. I haven't got that one. Maybe that's half hour of silence in heaven or something like that. That's a thought right there. That's a thought right there. And then, and then after that, then goes the next one, you know. <laughs> Off you go. Now, the, the, the blessing of this is to think about it. If there were such a thing, you'd have a warning just before the rapture. Because you'd hear the trumpet. Now, when, you know, down south with the color folks sing, they sing, you see where to get this stuff, Ruckman, out of a King James 1611 Bible. You never have to worry about MacArthur fixing it up for you. You never have to worry about Swindle, you know, helping you keep your family together and all that jazz, you know. You know what's happened this, a lot of this, a this brother talking about, you know what's happened in this country? This country has so many divorce, so many home breaking up because of television. Pornography in the living room, pornography in the bedroom, and everybody looking at everybody and patting everybody and slobbering over everybody. You got so many home breaking up that half the preachers have turned into family counselors. And they don't preach at all. They just give amateur psychological counseling. Now, you never learn your Bible that way. Oh, and I wouldn't be something here, if, suppose, suppose right now the trumpet, he said the last trump, which indicates more than one noise. So right now we're all sitting here, and then all of a sudden, all of we're in the body, we're one body, all of us hear the same sound at the same time. Wouldn't that be weird? Amen. We're all of us looking at each other, you know. <laughs> Everybody thinking the other person went crazy. Did you hear what I just heard? I don't forget one night I was driving down a hillside in a car, and I had a, had a loudspeaker in that car. You can have more fun with that. Get a loudspeaker and put it in the corner of the hood where they can't see it. And you talk about tearing a place up. Uh, you want some adventure. That's what you get one of them, see. You put into a, you know, a Wendy's or McDonald's Friday night or Saturday night after a ball game. And when you as soon as you wait, you get ready to leave, you know, and give you order and pay off your order. And then turn that thing on and say, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. <laughs> Boy, you'll see stuff that's flying all those cars. And you'd go out in the country and drive along, be great out here in some of the boondocks out here in Seattle, drive along at night, you know, about two in the morning, and say, uh, prepare to meet thy God. <laughs> you know, I've seen lights just pop on all over the country. <laughs> and I remember one time we were coasting down a hill with this thing in this car. I said to the kid, I said, put it in neutral so they can't hear it. We put it in neutral and coast down this place, and I turned that thing on. We went by a house, and I said, uh, it was late at night, about 11 o'clock at night, and there were a couple playing bridge, two couples playing bridge in this house. They're in a bay window right near the highway. As we went by, I said, it is a point a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. <laughs> and I think that in there, funniest thing you ever seen in your life, man. I had to tell the kid driving the car, I, I told him, I said, get, get the speaker off, get, get, get the speaker off, get the speaker off, man. I was about to have a heart attack laugh, and I was almost over the back seat. <laughs> Because when I said that, you could see the reaction, and all four of those people, they just finished dealing. They look at the hands, I guess, before the bidding started. And they had the hand like that, and when I said that, all four of them did the same thing. Just like twins, all four of them did this. <laughs> and when that co we coast out of sight, they were just looking at each other like this. And the guy driving the car told me, he got laughing about it. He said, you know, I bet, I bet you about now what I'm saying, would you please pass the judgment? I mean, please pass the cigarettes, you know. <laughs> Probably when they got up to say goodbye that night, one of them said, so long, we'll see you at the judgment. Or see you tomorrow. <laughs> and so if the Lord came right now and that thing blew off, you'd know something was about to happen. Now, how much after that, I don't know. Maybe the Lord ain't going to give you any time. Maybe it'll blow up. Maybe it'll give you, be a 30 second interval. But I've often wondered what would happen if it was about an hour interval, and you knew it. Now, what if the Lord alerted the whole body of Christ at the same time, and said, okay, you've got one hour. Wow. What would you do in that hour? You think about that? Right out there on the freeway, you don't stop. <laughs> and a car probably hits you, and you'd miss the rapture, you know. <laughs> So I guess the answer to that question is, I believe there's an interval, but I don't know how long the interval is. 
Oh, well, I have something else. Something else. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that we'll be raptured at Pentecost or at least from? All right, I get Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 in one hand. And Matthew chapter 24 in the other. Deuteronomy 16 and Matthew 24. Now the Feast of Trumpets as it stands is in the seventh month, Matthew 24. And the seventh month on a Jewish calendar is September and October, Matthew 24. When the Song of Solomon speaks about the rapture of the church, the bride of Christ, it says, the voice of my beloved, he comes leaping upon the mountains, he comes skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a young uh, heart, a roe that standeth behind the window, showeth his faithful at us. My beloved said, rise up, my love, my fair one, come away, for the winter is over, springtime. The rain is gone, March, April. The flowers appear, the voice of the turtle is heard in our land, arise, my love, and come away. Now that thing in the Song of Solomon chapter 2 is aimed at the Bride of Christ, and it's not in September and October. It's aimed at somebody in the spring. The rain's over, the flowers appear. This Feast of the Trumpets is not in March and April, it's in September and October, the, the seventh month for a Jew. My brother uh, Blue and I were talking about coming in from the airplane uh, about these feasts and things, and about these months, and I was calling his attention to the thing that... Uh, I didn't have a call to my attention. The Lord called to my attention about five years ago. If we did, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why nobody ever uh, read anything about the thing before. The nine million books in the Library of Congress, I haven't read all nine million of them. <laughs> but I've read 40,000 if I've read one. And I never read any discussion of this thing. But did you ever stop thinking about what a strange thing it is? That Jew's first month is March, April. Uh, what I said, March, April, it overlaps. It isn't exactly our March or April, it's overlap. The first month I do is March, April. The second one is April, May. The third one, May, June, so forth and so on. Now, our first month is January, supposedly. But man, oh man, whoever named those names in those months got the names peculiar. September, Septimus, Sept, White Seven. October, octagon, octopus, it's eight. November, novena, it's a nine. December, decimal, decimus, it's a ten. January, eleven, February, twelve, March, one. Now, boy, would Gar Ted Armstrong like to get a hold of that? <laughs> of course, he can't. But would he like to get a hold of that for British Israelism? You know what that thing is? It means the American calendar is follows the Jewish months. But nobody nobody pay attention to it. Why well, they don't they say December's the twelfth month. December don't mean twelve, means ten. It's November the eleventh month. Not any way in God's earth. The Latin means nine. So they they match we match the Jews uh, measurements. All right, Matthew chapter twenty four. Matthew chapter twenty four. Now, there's no doubt about this context. Look at the context. 21. Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not, so forth and so on. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation, those days, no problem. Verse 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, all over America today, you have little pamphlets denying the pre-tribulation rapture. And there in all the schools, the idea is that the pre-tribulation rapture was a false doctrine that came from a little Scottish girl that met with the Irvingites, and the Scottish Irvingites got it from a Jesuit priest in Spain, and blah, 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 for a buck. And all those people that take that thing and pick that thing up take Matthew 24 to prove that the church will go through the tribulation. Well, how'd they do that? They made the elect in that passage say people because they were five-point Calvinists, so they only could thought the elect was people in the body of Christ. Now, you said elect right there? you find that elect in Isaiah all the way through Isaiah. Look it up in a concordance. And that elect in Isaiah is never a reference to the body of Christ. It's a reference to the Jews. Matthew 24 is not on the body of Christ. You say, how do you know? 
Well, look at verse 30. Then shall they see the sign of the Son of what? Son of what? Man. Son of what? Man. Say it again. Man. You know why you want to get that? Paul never calls Christ the Son of Man. You couldn't find the Son of Man in any Pauline epistle in that book. Son of Man is a Jewish designation. Now, of course, we believe in Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, but isn't it interesting to notice that we're not waiting for the Son of Man, we're waiting for the Son of God. Amen. We're waiting for the Lord from heaven. It's the Jew that's waiting for the Son of Man. Why? Because the Jew has an earthly, physical, visible, literal kingdom, and the Son of Man is a man, an earthly, literal, physical, visible man. So Matthew 24 has no reference to the body of Christ in that past at all. Some is full of beans. But there's a trumpet there. But that trumpet is to gather Jewish elect. How do you know that? Look at verse 32. Look at verse 32. Fig tree. That isn't the body of Christ. That's Israel. How could you possibly miss it? Look at 16. Are you in Judea? Look at 16. That in the body of Christ? Is that you? 20. Do you have to worry about the Sabbath? Seventh day Adventist might, but you wouldn't. <laughs> Look at 20. You worry about a flight in the Sabbath? Not me. I fly the Sabbath all the time. That's Friday. It's Saturday. All right, so there's a trumpet and some kind of a rapture at a trumpet at the end of the tribulation. But it's a Jewish job. All right, Deuteronomy 16, 16. I'll try to get all this together if I can. Uh, just about have to draw it to get the thing plain. All right, here's Christ. Christ dies on the cross for your sins according to the Scriptures and buried and comes up the third day from the dead according to the Scriptures. All right, someday he's coming back to this earth and set up a reign on this earth for 1,000 years. When he comes back, you'll sit on the literal, physical, visible throne of David on this earth. And that's why those passages back in Psalm 91 and Psalm 17 that I gave you in Psalm 89, that's where they come in. They come in right there. That's the Holy Spirit speaking through to David, but David is a type of Christ. All right, before that thing takes place, you've got seven years tribulation. The passage you just read said there's a trumpet here and a gathering together of the elect here. But that thing there is in Daniel's 70th week. You know what that thing is called in the Bible? In Jeremiah, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, then it's not the, it's not the time of the church's trouble. <laughs> the time of the church's trouble is now. The time of Jacob's trouble is after the church is gone. So these people trying to tell you the church goes through the tribulation, they got the Bible screwed up. The tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. The church is not around, the church is gone. All right, now, Deuteronomy 16, 16, here are three Jewish feasts. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Now watch them carefully. One. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, that just happens to be when Christ was crucified, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's right there. That thing is March, April. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Feast of Weeks. That's Pentecost. That's 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's sitting right in there. That's when the Holy Spirit came down. It's called the Feast of Weeks because the word Pentecost means 50, and 50 follows a period of seven weeks each, seven times seven. Now, I'll draw you some more on that tonight. In the Feast of Weeks, comma, now watch it, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, the third one. When's the Feast of Tabernacles? Feast of Tabernacles, September, October. All right, you've got one feast here, and that thing is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's March, April. You have the next one over here, 50 days later. That thing is there, sitting there between May and June on the Jewish calendar. You have a third one sitting over there, and that's between September and October on the Jewish calendar. All right, there are three feasts given. Unleavened bread, Feast of Weeks, Tabernacles. Now, that Feast of Tabernacles is something else. That is something else. That's the seventh month. And if you ever wanted a date to hang your hat on the Bible, that'd be the date. All right, uh, come to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I'm not a date setter in the rapture. I never will be. People ask me all the time, when do you think a rapture is going to be? 
And I tell them I'm guessing, and I give them a guess. But I'm guessing. I don't think anybody knows when the rapture is. I think the rapture will be tonight. Amen. Preferably, it would have been a little bit better if it had been last night. But if it's one away to the night, it's okay with me. <laughs> but you take uh, th this fellow, what his name? Uh, oh, some, oh, I forget his name. Put out a pamphlet. Rowley had that pamphlet up. Uh, what? McCutcheon. McCutcheon. That's the guy, McCutcheon. He put out a pamphlet about three years ago. He had the date fixed. Lord going to come back. Ab rapture, absolutely. <laughs> and it misfired. So he put it up to the next year, and I'll be blew it again. And the last pamphlet that guy had, he's going to have the Lord come back April, April Fool's Day, <laughs> which I thought was a pretty good guess. <laughs> you, you'd be a fool if you thought you could date the rapture. There's no way to date it. All right, now Leviticus 23. Now watch the seventh month. 24. In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. There it is right there. That's your Feast of Trumpets, and that thing is September, October. And that's a Jewish trumpet blown for a Jewish remnant that's raptured at the end of the tribulation. The thing is sitting right there. Any hey, doubt in your mind about it? Uh, same passage, verse, uh, same passage, verse uh, 39. 15th day of the seventh month, verse 41, a feast of the Lord seven days, 42, dwelling booths, seven days. See that stuff? 34, the 15th day of this month, seventh month, should be the Feast of Tabernacles. See that thing? You know what that thing is there? That's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets, and if that weren't enough, look at verse 27. It's the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. That is the feast for a Jewish nation. You read Hosea, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, you know what find what that thing is called? That thing is called a Solemn Feast. The solemn feast, tabernacles. Well, that thing is sitting right there, and for a Jew, that date is approximately that on a calendar, and a Jew to this day calls it this. Yom Kippur. That's the Jewish New Year. So that date is fixed, and that is the date of the advent of Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. And no doubt about that one. That one is fixed. Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 1. We'll talk about this some more tonight, too. Matthew 16, 28, and then down to Matthew 17, 1. Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which will not taste of death. Watch it. Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And six days of tabernacles. That thing takes place at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Picture the second coming of Jesus Christ. Any doubt about it? Come to Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. Talking about the time that God's going to return and be with uh, Revelation 21. Revelation 21 verse 3. And be with men. These fellows always giving you Greek nuggets and Greek nuggets. Did you ever hear the Greek nugget about where it says, And the word, uh, and, uh, the word uh, became flesh uh, and dwelt among us? And they'll tell you that word, dwell among us, means tabernacle among us. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. All right. That's true. But isn't it amazing how that guy can find that in the Greek and then can't find this? If you know a tabernacle in the flesh, you know something else. You know the date of the first advent. And you know it wasn't Merry Christmas. It was Happy Halloween. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. It was in September. It was in September and October. It was in the fall, and that's why the shepherd from the field keeping the flock by night. It was in the fall. It wasn't in the winter. So you find that in the Greek. <laughs> Revelation twenty-one three. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, "Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them." See that thing? Now there's one more shot on this. You know the Lord doesn't leave Himself without a witness. And when God made the universe, made the star and the solar system, he set it up so if a man wanted to find it, he could find it. Now here goes the earth. That's you like that, going in circles. I knew you knew that already, but you're going in circles <laughs> like that. And this up here is north and south and east and west. And here goes the earth around like this. 
around the sun, sun in the center, over here in the fall, up here in the winter, and over here in the spring, down here in the summer. And as it goes around the earth, it's, uh, the sun is closer to the earth in the winter than it is in the, in the summer. But it tilts. And can you cut maybe one of those mics and get a little feedback? Is it maybe uh, well, you turn you turn that off until the next question would be probably. Um, so going around there like that, and the reason why you folks I notice up here at nine o'clock tonight, it's nice and bright up here. And I got up this morning about uh, five thirty. It was nice and bright five thirty. That thing is tilted. It's tilted over that way, and then when it tilts back the other way, then you got a problem. I was up in Dryden, Canada, uh, about a year or so ago, and boy, that's the strangest thing to have it getting dark at four in the afternoon. I'm just not used to that. And he said, "You wait later on and start getting dark three in the afternoon." Well, now here goes around here. Now here's here's the problem you got, and this is the problem that no scientist has got figured out, and they don't like to talk about. You see, scientists uh, they like to talk just so far. And then when you push them just out a foot further, they begin to get just as nervous a termite and a yo-yo. <laughs> now here's the problem. The sun am not there. <laughs> the sun am there. That's the problem. And the distance between there and there is several million miles more than the distance between there and there. And the problem is, how come that booger's off center? <laughs> Well, that's September 20, and that's 21, and that's 22, and that's 23, and the Son is the type of Christ. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heaven declared the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, day and the night under his speech, night and night shows knowledge, there's no language or speech for their voice not heard, in the ascent, the tabernacle, 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 you got that thing? Tabernacle for the sun, which is as, as, as a bridegroom coming forth and a strong man to run his race. Malachi chapter 4, you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, 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 wings. <laughs> the sun, type of Christ, where did that sun show up? On the fourth day, a one, a two, a three, a four. You know what the Lord did? When he created that thing, he gave you the dates of both advents and both advents on the same day. And there's no Greek or Hebrew scholar in the world who knows that. That's why they don't, if they don't believe that book. When you believe that book, you get it. All right, so you've got both advents are in the fall. Hence, now let's see if that's so. Hence, along about fall time, in every state of the Union, they have a fair. And when you go to the fair, you put up booths. Right? Isn't that what you call them? B-O-O-T-H-S. That's what he called them, Leviticus. You won't beat that book with a beating machine. Oh, I know about the question. <laughs> that one is fixed. There's a rapture there. That one is fixed, and we know there was a rapture there because the the graves were rent to, the, the rocks were rent too, and the graves were open, and many body of the saints that slept arose and were seen in the city following the resurrection. Or if there's one there and one there, then there's got to be one more because there's that thing sitting there. What's that? That's the Feast of Weeks. Now, if that format is right, you've got a rapture of Old Testament saints there, a rapture of New Testament saints there, and a rapture, and a rapture of tribulation saints there. You've got three raptures. Tell that to these fellows talk about a pre-tribulation post. They don't know what they're talking about. Once you put that book aside, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I, I agree with everything that you heard Brother Mondo say. If I'm going to say it, I'd say it just like he said it, except a little bit stronger. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I never cared to teach. That's why. I saw that thing, boy. I don't we, have, I, we can't stay here all day, but I've got, I've, I'll get back in this thing in a minute. But let me tell you now, when I, when I first got saved, I went off to Bob Jones University. I didn't go there to learn the Bible. Good thing I didn't. I'd have been disappointed. 
And I got there. You know how I went to that place? I went to that place because they said they didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't dance, didn't go to the movies. And I said to myself, that's a clean place. I've never been a clean place in my life. I never had. I went there because it's a clean place. And it's still a clean place. It's a good place for Christian young people. I get talking about these things. I know I'm not as, my bark isn't, my bite isn't bad as my bark, you know. But, you want to learn the Bible? You never learn it there. <laughs> but if you want to get a clean, that's a good clean atmosphere, they've got good high standards. So I went up there. And I got up there and came and sat down, an old bull moose, so and I came there 28 years old, four years in the infantry, played drum and a dance band at night in civilian life, and was a disc jockey in the daytime, and a bartender during the summer in a lifeguard when I was younger. I had had the treatment, man. I mean, nothing new has come up since I've been saved. Drugs. They were putting the bands I would play, the past on the marijuana, the bands I was playing in 1938. I was 1938 was smoking that stuff. Folks talk about integration. Integration. Man, I had a color boy playing piano for me in the living room of my house in Topeka, Kansas, in the white section in 1937. You fly some and catch up with me. And coming through there, I came up, I was sitting there, an old dog there, 28 years old, and all these kids around here, 19, 20, and 21. And up got Bob Jones Jr. to preach, and it was a robe choir. And he got up there the clerical choir. And I sat down that front row, looked at that thing, and I said, I just left this mess. <laughs> I've just been saved. I just got out of this mess. I'm not going to get back in this mess. <laughs> and the next Sunday, I didn't come to chapel. I went off to a country church called Pelham, South Carolina, back in the backwoods. Preacher's name is Harold Seinkler, the little country Southern Baptist church. The, moon will, the sun will be darkened in the daytime, brethren, and the moon will turn to blood. <laughs> and I went out of this country church and got out there, and uh, I knew I was the right place because I could hear him a mile away praying. That building was just rocking. And I came up the stairway, and some farmer, about six feet two, never saw him before in my life, ran down the stairway in his overalls and picked me up and hugged me and said, Glory to God, brother, and threw me against the wall and went on down. <laughs> And I said, this is the place, this is the place, this is the place. And so I got there in class and got sitting there, you know, and Brokenshire was up there, a Ph.D. from Heidelberg, Edinburgh, and you see, I'd been educated, but it hadn't taken. I already had a college education before I went to Bob Jones. I graduated from the University of Alabama in 44. But boy, let me tell you, after four years in the infantry, World War II infantry, brother, World War II infantry, I'd had a lot of stuff taken out of me. I mean, I saw that I learned something in infantry. I learned life ain't worth nothing. You can take a Ph.D. in six cents, you can kill him. That's what a 30 odd 6 shell costs, six cents. We call it six cent death. Guy lead a symphony orchestra, draft him, six cents. <coughs> like that, boy. I'm an all-star football player running across the minefield, both legs go up, one that way, one that way. It's a terrible thing to learn. I had to be... I had to be saved almost 20 years before I began to value uh, people again. Just so, so hard, you have to unlearn it. You learn, to, you learn that things aren't worth anything. You may have seen me drop a piece of chalk and kick it. Or, you know, the stand falls over and I'll say, well, that's how the snow blows, you know, and go on all that. it. I'm used to seeing stuff wasted. I've seen them line up two and a half ton trucks, drain the crack case, put a cement block on the pedal and just burn the block out. I mean, brand new two and a half ton trucks. I've seen them take helicopter sets, line them up, 300 bucks in 1947. Line them on the table, take ball peen hammers down, smash them to pieces so don't get loose in the market. And when you get used to that kind of stuff, you see, you see what men are worth. And by the time I got saved, I knew what education was worth. It wasn't worth anything. And I sat there on that thing and my old teacher, Broken Shire, said, In the parable of Dives and Lazarus, I raised my hand. You know, I was so green, if you stuck me in the ground, I'd have rooted, you know. I raised my hand, and I said, uh, what do you mean parable, doctor? He said, well, in Luke 16, Jesus is telling a parable. And I said, doesn't say it was a parable. He said, what do you mean, Mr. Ruckman? I said, well, when Abraham said it's a parable, he said it's a parable. He didn't say a parable there. And that old professor, about 70 years old, had a graduate degree from Edinburgh and Heidelberg, could speak, read, and write. I don't know how many languages. He said, explain yourself, Mr. Ruckman. I said, well, 
In Ezekiel chapter 20, when Ezekiel was preaching about hell, and said, The flaming flame shall burn all face from north to south, and shall never be quenched. They said of me, Our Lord God, doth he not speak parables? A little man stamped his feet on that chair and just turned crimson and said, Mr. Whitman, do you know Hebrew and Greek? I said, No, sir. And he said, well, I suggest that you keep your mouth shut. You know what you're talking about. I said, Yes, sir. And all those kids in the class turned and I looked at me, you know, and might take care of him, you know. They didn't know me. <laughs> God. It'll take more than that to take care of P.R.S. Ruckman. And I sat back there and watched that fellow for a while, and I said, well, now, so that's how the snow blows, huh? Well, okay, if you've got to learn Hebrew and Greek, we'll just stay here and learn Hebrew and Greek. So I stayed six years for spite. <laughs> 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 and learned until I found the pig in the poop. When I got out there, I didn't want to be like anybody in there. I mean, I was preaching the street. I still preach on the street. I enjoy preaching the street. Oh, and you take that thing right there. What I'm saying is you can't find that in the Greek and Hebrew. You say, what? They didn't find it. You say, what did you find it? You found it right there. Now, if that thing's true, in answer to your question, <laughs> there was a rapture there which took place uh, around the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There will be a rapture in the future, which will be 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> And there will be a rapture in September and October preceding the second coming of Christ. There is a Old Testament saint rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture, a post-tribulation rapture, which means first fruits, harvest, gleanings, which means you pick, pick a first tomato, few tomatoes and they get right, then you go out and get all of them, and then you get the rest a little bit later. There are three parts. Now, if that's right, of course, you'd have a temporary date in the rapture, which I don't date. What I showed you there, I showed you for your edification, and I did not tell you that the rapture would be 50 days after uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, so don't say I said that, because I did not say that. I said the scriptures would seem to indicate that, <laughs> you see, but I don't teach that. I'm not going to tell you now you can relax till next May. <laughs> Okay, one more, and we'll close out here for today. Got one more. Yes, sir. Not take too much time, but David's coming back to reign. Yeah. And Judas' resurrection. Yeah. How many more of the Old Testament saints or Peter are going to come back? And what are they going to represent after Jesus? Who are they going to be? Oh, I'd get Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 10 in one hand. And get, uh, and get Revelation chapter 10 and the other. Matthew 10, Revelation 10. Now what he's referring to is this fact. We know that Judas, at least in the spirit, not in body of course, but in the spirit will come up in the bottomless pit and enter the son of perdition, the Antichrist. That's a kind of a second coming. Uh, we know that uh, David is coming back because he'll reign over Israel in eternity in Ezekiel chapter Oh, I think it's about 33, 34. Uh, Christ, the new Jerusalem, David on earth. And the question is, are there any more? All right, Revelation chapter 10. Here's a strange thing. Revelation 10, 10. Here's God talking to John after John has seen the revelation. Uh, revelation 10, 10. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. It was my mouth sweet as honey. As soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, Thou must prophesy again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. When? You don't read about it in the book of Revelation anywhere. When John gets that, he's on Patmos and gets his head cut off. But it says, You'll prophesy again, to old John. Now here's the real hard one, Matthew 10. And if you get out your commentaries and read on Matthew chapter 10, you'll find all the brethren decide this verse is not in the Bible and just refuse to comment on it. You say, did you comment in your commentary? Yes. You say, what was your comment? Your, my comment was, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Matthew 10. This is one of the roughest verses of the Bible. It is really something. Matthew 10, 22. Matthew 10, 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. 
Now that thing mat matches Matthew 24, 13 in the tribulation and matches Daniel 12, 12 in the tribulation. So it's a tribulation passage of the stands of prophecy. But look at here, 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. What a thing to say. Why, it couldn't be in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts, when the persecution arose out because of Stephen, they all stayed in Jerusalem. Go to the cities of Israel? Why, uh, look at Matthew 11, 1 and 2. Matthew 11, 1 and 2. See that? They went out right then and went all over the place, teaching and preaching in the cities. And they came back to Christ, and he hadn't yet come yet. The second advent reference. You shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, they do in chapter 11, till the Son of Man be come. He's already there. It's the second, ad, the second advent reference. What a thing to say. And you see, you get these things. There's some things in the Bible that are milk, and some are honey, and some are bread, and some are strong meat. And one of the ways I've gained a real bad reputation myself among the brethren is I try to feel every question that's shot at me the best I know how. And I'll show you why that is in a minute from the book of Proverbs. But when you do that, you get into some heavy stuff. And first thing you know, Ruckman teaches this, Ruckman teaches that, or Ruckman teaches this heresy, this one of his peculiar teaching, blam, blam. Well, now you say, what do I teach about that thing there? I don't teach anything deaf in that thing there because they don't understand it. But in line with your question that you asked, it looks like... <laughs> It looks like there's going to be more than David and Judas coming back. It looks like in the passage here there's a future tribulation commission for the twelve. Or at least Matthias has the replacement, which would mean they'd come back and preach in the tribulation. Well, that's a wild thing, see. Matter of fact, that's so wild, I don't even preach it. <laughs> because they're in the body of Christ. Uh, Christ prayed in John 17, they may be one as we are one, I and them, and thou and me as they are in us. So the part of the body of Christ, I don't think part of the body of Christ can be back here in tribulation. So it's a dark horse. You say, what does it mean? Beats the fire in me, I don't know what it means. <laughs> but there it is. It may be a thing, uh, may be a thing where they haven't gone with the cities of Israel yet, but when their successors, the 144,000 go with the cities of Israel. Something like that, see, but boy, it's 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 hard. So the answer to your question is, brother, is I do not know how many are going to come back. Well, can I add one thing? Yes, sir. Is Baal just no suspect in In Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, which have a doctrinal application to the local church of the tribulation, it does mention Balaam and does mention Jezebel. I take that to mean as illustration, not literally. But I don't deny that it could happen. <laughs> you say you're kind of like a politician. Yeah, exactly. That's about a, like the fellow asked to give his position for something. And he said, I want to have you know that I am definitely for waiting to tell you what I think about this thing <laughs> and stay in the fence. I'll give, you one, I'll give you one clue, which is a rough clue. In Ezra and Nehemiah, when you get the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, which is the return of the Jews, 48, and the rebuilding, 88, preceding the rapture, book of Esther. When you get to Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll find a sudden reoccurrence of all the important people in the Old Testament, named again for no reason at all. You'll find Obadiah, the word Obadiah in there, the word Elijah, the word Judah. You'll find the whole thing popping up again. And I'll tell you what it's like. I, I don't teach this doctrine. It's like when the church is caught out that the resurrection of Old Testament saints takes place then. And they come up and go into the tribulation. I don't know if I believe that. I'm not selling my mind on it. I rather think they come up at the end of the tribulation and go in the millennium. But if such a thing is true, then you can have all kinds of stuff coming up to go in the tribulation. But that's a wild, that's a wild doctrine, but that's of course the Bible's a wild book. <laughs> Oh, I come back, let's close here. Let's go back to the book of uh, Proverbs. And let me show you something here. The book of Proverbs. The Lord uh, gave me many, many years ago 
22, uh, Proverbs 22. And this is why I go into these heavier things, because of this. I don't want to understand. We train a young man down in our school to go out and preach. We tell him, for goodness sake, the first Sunday you're out, don't preach on the ten horns on the Satan or the blood-sucking angels from Jupiter, you know, or whether Eve, you know, had a relationship with the devil. I mean, there's more to the Bible than that, man. You can preach on prayer and soul winning. I'm, people get a funny idea about balance, you know. I think they read the Baptist bullet and they think that I spend my whole time just attacking the brethren. I've got, in that uh, book right over there, lying there on that thing there, I've got 250 sermons. Three of them are on the King James Bible. Three of them. Out of 250. The rest are on prayer, soul winning, consecration, moderate, temperance, laziness, gluttony, raising children, stay in fellowship with the Lord. There's more to preach than that stuff. All right, Proverbs 22, verse 17. Now, when I first got saved, I'm like I am now. I took the Bible real literally and real personally. Probably even more personal than I do right now. Every then I go through something, and just like the Holy Spirit says, Now, I'm writing this for you. Did you know that's why reading the Bible creates individuals? Did you ever wonder why we don't have any great statesmen anymore? All we have is politicians. Uh, Reagan, 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 whatever his name is, uh, I don't think he's a god in flesh or anything. I mean, uh, I, I don't appreciate a bit. He's fooling around with the Pope and a lot of things he's done. But I'll say one thing with that bird. That's the first bird I've ever seen in office that tried to do what he said he'd do before he got in. Now, he ain't doing it, and he can't do it, <laughs> but he's trying. I've been around a while. You know, when I came in, Calvin Coolidge was here. I was back pretty far, man. I saw Hoover come in, Roosevelt come in, all that bunch. And the first man I ever saw ever get in that tried to do what he said he'd do was Reagan. That's the first one. But you take those politicians that come in like that and, well, oh, come, what was I going to say? I don't lost my train of thought here. I'll get that thing in a while. I'm talking about God speaking to me personally and showing me things. The book of the Word of God that I took personally. Now, how did I get those politicians in it? Individualism. That's right. I'm talking about individualism. What I'm saying is this: You don't have people like Jefferson and Hamilton and Davis and that bunch. You know why that is? Because politicians no longer read the Bible. Reading the Bible makes you an individual. Why? Because when you read it, God speaks to you through one verse. He don't fool with with me. Somebody said, "Oh, if they go down there, Ruckman School, they all come out just like Ruckman." No, they sure don't. They all come out individuals. You know why? Because they spend time in the book. This book produces a rugged individualism. And you can't make a, you can't make slaves out of people who read this book. They won't submit. They won't submit. You can make slaves out of Catholics. If a country is Catholic, it'll go communist. But you can't take a bunch of Bible reading people and make them communists. Because it may, it, it's individualism. Our modern politicians and our preachers to some extent are always coming out, they're just coming out like a string of bologna sausage off a bologna sausage factory. And the reason why is they don't read the book. And when you read this book, certain verses will right in your face that won't come out in my face. And certain verses will come out at me that won't come out at you. I haven't been to save two months, then I got this. 22.17 Bow down thine ear. So I did. And hear the words of the wise, so I did. And apply thine heart to my knowledge, so I did. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, so I did. They shall with all be fitted in thy lips. So you get it down here and pretty soon it will come out here. That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have I not written to thee excellent things in counsel and knowledge? I said, yeah, Lord, you sure have. And he said, I'll tell you why I did it, Ruckman. That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. The pastor sends unto me I'm to come here to give you the truth and to make you know the certainty of the words of truth. All right, brother.